Good afternoon. I have the distinct privilege to introduce a man who is a true conservative Republican, a true friend of the Republican Jewish Coalition, Senator Fred Thompson. In 1969, Fred Thompson was named an assistant United States attorney in Nashville, where he earned the reputation as a tough prosecutor. Three years later, he would help manage U.S. Senator Howard Baker's re-election campaign. In 1973, at the age of 30, he was off to Washington, where he served under the glaring spotlight of the Watergate scandal as minority counsel to the Senate Watergate Committee. He brought credit and honor to our party in his conduct of that position. Following a successful legal and acting career, in 1994, the senator ran to fill the remaining two years of a remaining uh, unexpired Senate seat. Down by 20 points, he stumped for a return to conservative principles at a time when most political pundits were saying Republicans had to run like Democrats to win. History repeats. But he talked about tax cuts smaller government, and sound foreign policy. He ran his race as a conservative, and he won by 20 points. This initiated his success as a conservative who knew how to be elected with bipartisan support. In 1995, in response to the senator's interest in having a deeper understanding of the mutual value and benefits resulting from a strong U.S.-Israel relationship, it was my pleasure to take the senator to Israel together with friends from our community, including most particularly Miriam and Sheldon Adelson. Thus began a serious friendship. As a senator, he continued to carry out his personal mandate to his state. As chairman of the Senate Governmental Affairs Committee, the senator enacted a law that required federal agencies to calculate and report the cost of regulations on taxpayers and businesses. He also opened an impressive investigation into the attempts by the Chinese government to influence American policies and elections through financing election campaigns. He published reports on waste, fraud, and abuse. He did accountability in the honorable tradition of the Senate, not on the basis of politics, just to expose where we could do better. As a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, he focused on the threat of nuclear proliferation, technology transfers that could damage American industry and our national security. He served on the Intelligence Committee at a time when it examined the failings of intelligence and provided the analysis leading to the betterment of our safeguards against terrorism through coordinated government policies. In 2005, he was named as President Bush, by President Bush as an advisor to Supreme Court Chief Justice nominee John Roberts, and he helped navigate that difficult confirmation process successfully. He continues his public service as chairman of the State Department's International Security Advisory Board. He knows what's going on in the world. He's maintained his access to all the proper intelligence information. Finally, as to Israel, while in the Senate, he has an absolutely solid record of supporting Israel and the Israeli people, and he maintains that support today. Following the New Hampshire Democratic presidential candidate debate last September, he stated how appalled he was that none of the leading Democrats would stand up for Israel's right to defend itself against Iran, and that he would do just the opposite. Senator Thompson is committed to the security of Israel, the safety of the Israeli people, and the enhancement of the American-Israeli partnership. He based that on the historical 
and cultural ties between our peoples and nations. He has been a friend of this community and a friend of this coalition. And as often said, the hallmark of the RJC is that we stand with our friends. So I'm particularly pleased to present to the coalition our friend, Senator Fred Thompson, together with his wife, Jerry Thompson. Good to see you. Thank you very much. I understand that I'm all that stands in the way between you and refreshment, so I will try to keep that in mind. Good to see so many good friends. Mark, thank you very much for, uh, for that great introduction. You brought back fond memories of uh, the first trip that I took as United States Senator to Israel, uh, and the first time that uh, I met Sheldon and Miriam, by the way, and uh, wonderful to see you here again, uh, people who have done so much uh, for so many people. But uh, <clears throat> I, um, I especially want to thank Mark, who's been such a good friend ever since uh, before that trip. And uh, he's a good counselor and, uh, and a wise one. And uh, we've had an opportunity to spend quite a bit of time talking about issues that are uh, important uh, to all of us. Uh, I know that... Uh, Mitt and I probably are having a tough time here coming in and following our spouses. Uh, we got reports back today, and uh, I think that this probably will be a come down, and there's nothing that I can do about it. But I appreciate your hospitality. I understand that uh, all of the spouses uh, did a great job today, and I think that's a wonderful addition to what you're doing. <clears throat> I'm beginning to get a few crests. Fred, it's okay if you can't show up. If Jerry can, that's okay. And I have a little mixed feelings about that, but uh, I think it's a good thing. My friends, um, I want to talk to you a couple of minutes about issues that are very important to me and why I'm standing here before you today. I simply think that we live in the strongest and most prosperous country in the history of the world. And it's up to us to make sure that we keep it that way. <clears throat> and that we remember how we got here. And uh, we've been blessed in a lot of respects. Many parts of it have nothing to do with uh, ourselves or even our founding fathers. We were placed geographically in a place in the world in the very beginning in the United States uh, where people kind of left us alone. We were far away uh, at that time to let us do our own thing and the things that we did as a nation. Fortunately, we had people who understood the wisdom of the ages, who uh, understood that there is such a thing as human nature, who understood the nature of tyranny and what we should do about it. And we got our founding documents uh, out of that, the Declaration of Independence, reminding us that our laws come from God and not from government. A constitution of the United States that separates power out, not just at the federal level, but between the federal and the state level, to diffuse power, to guarantee liberty, economic liberty, uh, individual liberty, political li liberty, with the understanding that all those things uh, go together uh, and interrelate. And from those beginnings, we derived our principles uh, in this country, first and foremost, was that in the necessity, the absolute necessity, to defend our people at all costs and to respect other people who were doing the same. We came from that basic proposition, not only as a great nation, but as a good nation. And our people have shed more blood for the liberty of other people's freedom than any other combination of countries in the world. From that, we took the working day principles that we have lived by ever since, the rule of law and the importance of it, underlies everything else, market economies, 
free and fair competition among our citizens, trade with other nations, belief in government that doesn't tax and spend and regulate its people to death and sap the very essence of what is American from uh, Americans, to provide a country that a uh, small boy from Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, or anybody else who wants to, who wants to work and play by the rules and have a few people that love him, have a chance to live the American dream, a country where if you need some help that you'll get it, but if you can help yourself that you're expected to do so. That's the kind of country I was raised in. That's the kind of country that we still have and that we must protect at all costs. There is, no, there is no issue that we are confronted with today that the application of those principles will not address. But my friends, there are major challenges to our security and our prosperity. With regard to our prosperity, we're going to be facing uh, from the Democratic nominee next year in the election a continuation of the siren song that's been playing for some time uh, from them and their nominees and their leaders uh, in Congress. They're expecting uh, a windfall, really, an unexpected blessing from their standpoint, and that is additional revenues of trillions of dollars falling into their lap that uh, nobody's going to have to vote for. The expiration of the tax cuts, the the alternative minimum tax, uh, which was designed to hit 155 people, now covering millions of people, over 20 million people now this calendar year, all of that coming about without having to pass any laws. And we're hearing them tell the American people that, in effect, we now have the keys to our own treasury. We are a democracy. We can do what we want to do. There's no reason to apply restraint. There is no particular reason to worry about the next generation or the generation after that, both of whom we are in the process of bankrupting, incidentally, with our mandatory spending programs and the glad path we're on, which every economist in the world says is unsustainable. And as far as our taxes are concerned, they're telling us, basically, and we'll be telling the American people, 40% of the people pay about 99% of the taxes. Why not 35% of the people? Make more people happy? Why not 30% of the people that pay 99 or maybe 100% of the taxes? And they also tell us if we'll just bring the troops home, that the wicked, wild world will go away from us, will not visit us uh, anymore. That is all that we will have to do. My friends, that would cause us to settle into a comfortable mediocrity under which we would have neither peace nor prosperity. It would take us down the road that so many other great civilizations has gone down into second-rate status. My friends, that's what this election next year is all about, and that's why this philosophy, this road, must be rejected. This liberal philosophy must be rejected at all costs. And that's what we intend to do this next election year. I mentioned a major challenge to our security. We have yet fully to come to terms with the fact that Islamic fascism has declared war upon us and the Western world. Uh, it's been going on for some time now. We've been attacked time and time again for decades around the world in various parts of the world. Didn't really recognize it, many people. Uh, until September 11, we realized the homeland was, was not protected. The continental United States was not protected. Um, our enemies view this as something that's been going on for perhaps hundreds of years, and they're plenty patient to have it go on for a hundred or a couple more while they're waiting for the 12th Imam and killing as many innocent people as they can. Uh, along the way. They play by no rules. Their intent is to bring down Western civilization and primarily the United States of America. They feel like that they're on track. They say that the Soviet Union was the biggest obstacle and the biggest threat and the toughest foe that they had, and they defeated them in Afghanistan. And so we're on track. Iraq is a current 
front in that war, but Iraq is not the totality of that war. This war will be with us long after difficulties in Iraq are in our rearview mirror. And the American people need to understand that, understand the nature of it, the duration of it, and yes, even the cost of it. And the fact we're spending about 4% of our, our budget now uh, on our military as our allies and NATO partners uh, are spending less and less and less uh, on defense themselves. That is the world that we live in. And the whole world watches, both friend and foe alike, to see what we're going to do with regard to this current front and with regard to the world in, in general and the war that we're involved in. They're looking to see whether or not we're going to have the will, uh, whether or not we're going to have the determination, whether or not we're going to have the unity as they fight over things all large and small and meaningless and significant in the United States Congress, and their approval rating jumps up to, I think, 11 percent now. They watch, they watch, and they wonder about the future of the United States, and our friends wonder the most. Our friends wonder the most whether or not we're going to be willing to do what is necessary to stand by our friends in tough times. It is vital. It is vital that we signal our friends and foes alike that we will do whatever is necessary wherever we must draw the line to prevail in any front that we face. Now, the enemy that we face is a common one with Israel. I've supported uh, a strong Israel, as Mark said, uh, my entire eight years in the United States Senate. I supported a strong relationship between Israel and the United States. I did so because I thought it was the right thing to do, and I did so because I thought it was the very best thing uh, for the United States of America. Our cultural and our religious ties are strong. Our mutual security interests are absolutely clear. And we have a common goal. That common goal is peace. And I believe that strength and determination is the most important element in securing that, speed, that, that, uh, that peace. And I think it's also important that we recognize the nature of the world that we live in. Now, Iran is the premier state sponsor of terrorism in the world. It's a country intent on acquiring nuclear weapons, whose leader has threatened to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. This is a country that is supporting terrorist groups throughout the Middle East, such as Hamas and Hezbollah. Iran is responsible for supplying weapons to extremists who are killing U.S. forces in Iran and Afghanistan. With its ongoing pursuit of nuclear weapons and development of long-range missiles, it's a threat not only to the region, it's a threat to our allies, and it's a threat to the entire free world. Now, if you want a sneak preview of what life will be like if we lose this war, all you have to do is look at Tehran, the Gaza Strip, or the Anbar province before the United States got this area under control. This culture of radicalism is being pushed on the next generation all around the world. Islamists from Saudi Arabia and Pakistan and elsewhere are funding madrasas or Wahhabist mosques and madrasas in their own countries as well as in Europe and in Asia and indeed the United States of America. The sermons delivered at these mosques and the textbooks in these schools teach hatred and intolerance, which is the trademark of the rigid and radical Wahhabi version of Islam. Counter-terrorist experts describe the mosque and schools as an assembly line that produces the next generation of terrorists. It's hard enough to stop the current generation 
We must do more to prevent the next generation. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the current generation is getting enormous and invaluable support from the Iranian regime. Hardly a day goes by without General Petraeus or some other American military officer informing us about Iranian military and intelligence officers, Iranian-trained terrorists, Iranian bombs, and Iranian money, all devoted to supporting the terrorists in Iran and Afghanistan. You can hear the same sort of information from Israelis. They've had to contend with Iranian-equipped groups like Hezbollah and Hamas and Islamic Jihad on a daily basis. Some of those rockets that land in Israeli school cafeterias and uh, playgrounds in Sderot are manufactured in Iran. Many of the terrorists launched those rockets were trained in Iran. The terror masters in Tehran and Damascus make only the most minor distinctions between the United States of America and Israel. They say that America is the great Satan and Israel is the little Satan. But they most, both must be destroyed. They organized the assassination of Lebanese political leaders and turned that aspiring democracy into little more than a hostage state. The U.S. must make it clear that we will not allow Iran to become a nuclear threat. <laughs> the military option must never be off the table. <clears throat> we must also make it clear that we support Israel's right to defend itself. And as we pursue sanctions and other traditional means, we need to take other steps to reach out to the Iranian people themselves and help them get rid of their hated regime. <clears throat> In these efforts, we need the help of our traditional allies in Europe and Asia. We need the assistance of friendly Arab states in the region. And maybe most importantly, we need the active involvement of moderate Muslims and religious leaders to wrest back their faith and indeed their peoples from this cult of death. <clears throat> Our goal is simply this, peace and freedom. The U.S. must willingly accept this accustomed role of leadership in this effort. This is the ultimate challenge of our generation, and we must accept that challenge and meet it with confidence, faith, and determination. Our nation is steeped in the tradition of honor and sacrifice for the greater good. We will defend that tradition with the knowledge that nothing less than the security and prosperity of our nation and all those who love freedom depends upon it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Being mindful of the uh, of the hour that it is, I'm going to let you determine how long you. Uh, you uh, you want to to stay here, but I'm going to take questions as long as you want me to. I take this is the yeah. this is the line. Yes, sir. Uh, what would you do to solve the energy dependence on the Middle East? Problem? We're going to have to do a lot of things better, and I'll mention something up front that oftentimes I don't hear mentioned in the the litany of directions we need to go in. And that is do everything we can for world stability. The United States uh, has been a stabilizing influence on the world for a long time, uh, since World War II. 
and we've had a protective umbrella under the theory of deterrence for quite a while, and now the world has changed around us. And it's not just one great superpower against us. It's a, it's a, it's a world that has terrorist states and terrorists that have no allegiance to any uh, particular state. So that job in and of itself, and deterrence doesn't work oftentimes against some of these. So we're fashioning a new way to respond to all of that. But how we do that and the tools we bring to bear in terms of our, our military and in terms of our intelligence capabilities and our alliances and, and those sorts of things is, uh, is going to determine in large part world stability. And almost every economic downturn, I think, in the last 25 years has been preceded by a spike in oil prices. So that's important. I think, secondly, we've got to uh, look at our own resources. We've got to do more here with what we have here. Uh, there's coal technology now. Uh, I'm talking in terms of, of oil and natural gas. There's coal technology now that's going to allow us, I think, to do things we've never done before, gasification and uh, sequestration technology and that sort of thing. Uh, one thing that we've got plenty of. Uh, we've also got plenty of nuclear energy if we utilize it. We're getting about 20 percent now from uh, our electricity from uh, that source. A lot of nations, so-called green nations, uh, are getting a lot more than that than we are. We took that off the table uh, back in the 70s, and uh, we've got to put it uh, back on uh, the table again. Um, I think that there's certainly a place for alternatives and um, renewables uh, without question. Uh, we've got to explore that. Uh, research and development. That's an easy throwaway line, but I often wondered, you know, how long has it been since we didn't have a, a computer in every room of our house? And our little, you know, children were, were operating them, presenting new challenges, uh, you know, for, for all of us. We're a nation of innovation and technology and creativity. Uh, we have got to consider things. We've got to pursue things and allow people to pursue things and encourage the pursuit of things that aren't on the table yet. Uh, in terms of developing technology. But uh, the problem is a real one. We're getting, uh, what, 60 percent of, uh, of our oil uh, from abroad. Much of that is coming from trouble spots uh, in the world, uh, places that uh, uh, could have blow-ups at any time and cause these sp spikes I'm talking about. Uh, it's not a matter of no oil being available. I think at least for a while there's going to be plenty of oil available. It's a price matter. And with $80 a barrel oil, it doesn't need to get much higher. It's really a testament to our economy being as strong as it is, the fact that we haven't had more repercussions from the price of oil being as high as it, as it already is, uh, which I think is because of some sound conservative principles that were injected uh, back in 2001 and 2003 in terms of these tax cuts. But to me, that's the overall picture, and those are the, those are the areas and the things that we need to pursue. <coughs> Senator? Uh, yes, sir. It's an honor, sir. Thank um, you. As a Republican blogger who understands and appreciates that freedom of the press comes with responsibility, um, are you willing to forcefully enforce the Bush doctrine that anybody that supports and aids terrorists, even if it's our own cultural institutions, two examples being Poison Ivy League universities that believe in tea with Mussolini and Colombian coffee with Armageddon Najad, and secondly, a newspaper run by a Jewish person I'm not related to and I apologize for that gives up our troop movements, getting them killed, a.k.a. the Jason Blair Times. How do you balance as a member of the media yourself the First Amendment with the fact that we cannot have our own soldiers getting killed by our own media and we cannot have our own cultural institutions allowing murderers who should be in Gitmo teaching our kids? <clears throat> As far as, uh, as far as me being a member of the media, young man, that's one accusation I will not accept. <laughs> okay, formerly maybe, formerly. I uh, did a little television and radio work, uh, so I'm very well aware of what you're talking about. There's a lot of irresponsibility going on in this country. Some of it's protected by free speech and some of it's not. But it, it, number one, it ought to be labeled is totally, totally irresponsible, and I think it ought to be punished in the marketplace. Uh, people ought to be thinking about who they want to do business with and what kind of a political uh, 
uh, pressure they can bring to bear legitimately in the, in the marketplace of free ideas. You know, the nutcases are not the only ones who have free speech. Uh, so we need to confront it uh, on that basis. There is also the problem in some of the more uh, so-called uh, enlightened media that they don't accept what I suggested a while ago was the case. And that is that we're, in effect, in a, in a global war. And they don't, we don't understand the stakes. We don't understand the importance of this to our country. Now, how anyone could ever do anything to compromise one troop uh, is beyond me. Uh, those, those people will have to answer to, to, to a higher authority than me uh, one of these days. And if they violate the law, we ought to take advantage of that opportunity to do whatever we can to them. But underlying a lot of this, and you don't see more criticism of it or recognition of it in the media, because I think some people do not recognize the nature of the, of the global conflict that we're dealing with here. They think it's located. They think it's isolated. They think what is a front is really the war, and um, do not appreciate the, the, the stick to the determination, uh, the will that we're going to need. Uh, to prevail in this. You know, Andrew Roberts uh, wrote not too long ago a book called The, uh, the History of the English-Speaking People since, 1900, uh, since the 1900s. And there, in, in there he said, the will of the people to prevail is at least as important as their military might. And I think it's something we all, all keep in mind. Yes, sir. Senator Thompson, as president, I'd like to know, would you consider, would you consider pardoning Jonathan Pollard? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, not unless some new facts were brought to my attention that I do not know about. I do not know about the details of this case, but under current circumstances, the answer would be no. Uh, he was convicted of spying against my country. And uh, that's basically what I know. And uh, I think that uh, he went through the process and got due process. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, he'll finish out his prison term. Senator, <clears throat> yes, ma'am. You, you mentioned friendly Arab states. I thought that was an oxymoron, and it was somewhat of a revelation to me. So could you please tell us, sir? Who, what are the friendly Arab states? Well, um, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to mislabel anybody, either friend um, or uh, enemy. Uh, we've had a trading relationship and um, and some beneficial relationship with Jordan for some time, for example. Um, I've got a uh, a lot of problems with Saudi Arabia. I think that we need to uh, think carefully about this arms deal that we did with them. I think we need to extract some understandings from them because of what's going on in that nation. Uh, and the center of the Wahhabists, uh, for example, and the, and the bargain that they made a long time ago as far as they're concerned. Having said all that, having said all that, there's some interdependence there that we're having to work our way out of to be quite honest with you, and I don't want to call him an enemy because I don't consider him to be an enemy. A lot of, a lot of shortcomings, and we could go around the, the area, and you're right, there are very free, few friendly faces, but there is some hope, uh, some glimmers of hope from some places at some times uh, in that part of the world. We simply have to take advantage of it if it appears. Uh, it's an honor, sir. Um, my question is this. Um, I'm a college student and a younger Republican and an older brother, so um, I want to know, when you are president, what will you do to uh, combat violence in schools and um, also to uh, stem the tide of uh, corrupting influences in our society? Well, sometimes when I get a question about what are you going to do from, from my generation, from a young person, I respond uh, that I'm going to do my best to protect you from my generation. Uh, and uh, I think there's a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of truth to that. You can't help but be terrified and and, and appalled beyond belief when you read about uh, some young person killing another person. Um, 
Jerry and I have two small children. I've been blessed with children earlier in my life and a little bit later in my life. And we have two children, uh, four and one, uh, at home. Everything you become more sensitive to. Everything. And this is uh, certainly true with regard to that sort of thing. I don't think anybody honestly, truly knows or has a government program that is going to cure that. Um, I think that there are some deep societal issues there. I think a lot of it begins in the home. Uh, I think a lot of the problems that we, we have today uh, have not to do as much with young people as the parents of young people uh, and uh, the need for more responsibility uh, there. I think that there are a lot of uh, influences in society that are negative. Some of the music uh, that, we, that we hear, uh, some of the things that are creeping into prime time television and that sort of thing, I think, I think we've got to acknowledge uh, that uh, they all have their effect. Uh, I think being sensitive to that, using the, the presidential bully pulpit to speak the truth, just as I did about families, uh, for example, and what I believe to be a greater need for fathers in the home, particularly, which uh, uh, are oftentimes uh, not the case, uh, would be a good thing. But I would be hesitant to try to pass uh, legislation on the national level that would abridge Second Amendment rights because you would not be able to take guns out of the hands of the bad people alone. Uh, you would be, in effect, taking hands out of the good out of the hands of, of, of good people and leaving the bad people as, uh, uh, as they are. Uh, so uh, that's not a specific program that I've got to address it, but I hope that you can uh, feel what's in my heart and the direction I'd be coming from. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, ma'am. Senator, pleasure. Um, one of the things that we know about you is that you're a Federalist in states' rights. Mm -hmm. Um, could you please give a short explanation? A lot of people say, yeah, Fred's a Federalist and states' rights, but would you please explain your Federalist stance? Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I've, I've uh, learned that some people, when I say I'm a Federalist, they, they think I'm for a uh, bigger federal government. So thank you for that question. Give me an opportunity. Um, I don't use the, 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 the phrase states' rights myself uh, anymore. Uh, I understand the, the concept, uh, um, and, and it's a part of what we're talking about. But it basically is something that uh, our founding fathers set up in the Constitution. And it basically is uh, the proposition that not all solutions to all problems are found in Washington, D.C. That uh, when any issue is presented, that uh, a political leader ought to ask himself two questions. Is this under the proper purview of government? And secondly, if so, at what level of government? So our founding fathers uh, spread out the power. We're familiar with our checks and balances at the federal level. But oftentimes we, fit, uh, we, we forget that they set up the same thing with regard to uh, the state government. And they gave us the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution particularly uh, to make that uh, clear. All designed not because they thought it would look good on an organizational chart, but to ensure freedom, because they knew the lessons of tyranny and what can happen when too much power is in uh, too few hands. As issues come up, you have to balance it. It is uh, true that, that uh, uh, there is also an interstate commerce clause in the Constitution. The federal government's got some very uh, important roles. Uh, I have been concerned over the past years that a federal judiciary has increasingly taken the Commerce Clause, for example, and expanded it to include everything in the world, to give the federal government jurisdiction and legislative rights with regard to everything, even the most minute matter that happens in one particular locality and could not have any, any relationship to interstate commerce. So the issues themselves oftentimes are fact-based. You have to look at it. You have to recognize that we do live in a different world. Our transportation and and communications uh, uh, world that we live in is different than our founding fathers, of course. So you have to make some adjustments for that. So it doesn't fall on any automatic side. But the process of asking yourself, is this the proper purview? Because states and um, localities are set up that way for a reason. We get the benefit of competition among the states. We get the benefit of ingenuity and imagination. 
You know, we fought for welfare reform for 20 years. I campaigned on it, went to Washington in 1994, started in 95, and we passed welfare reform after, after 20 years. That started at the state level. Those ideas there started at the state level. There are plenty of good ideas germinating out there, and some have already been uh, tried and served as an example for other states, or maybe even, as with welfare reform, serve as an example for the federal government. So we're losing these laboratories of democracy if we don't recognize what's in the Constitution. And that's the basis of my federalism beliefs. Thank you very much. Sir, in the context, in the context of the recent Israeli strikes against the nascent uh, Syrian nuclear program, uh, particularly one aspect of that would have been that the Israeli planes were given the IFF codes that identified them as friends to U.S. forces. What would be your opinion on a cooperative strike against either Hezbollah in Lebanon or Syria or Iran, for that matter, between the U.S. and Israel? I don't see how anybody running for president can tell you the conditions under which you would enter into an agreement like that. Uh, what you can do is uh, state your, your underlying beliefs and principles. Um, I have a strong belief in the necess not only the right to, but the necessity for Israel to do everything uh, that it can to uh, preserve itself and to defend itself. And nobody knows better than the Israelis. <clears throat> nobody knows. They did it in 1981 as far as Iraq was concerned. And people objected to that. We, we objected to that. Our, our government objected to the Israelis doing that. We were wrong. Uh, I'm glad they did uh, what they did to set Saddam back a little bit uh, as, as far as his uh, nuclear intentions were, were concerned. Um, and as far as Syria was concerned, I, I, think, I think that uh, I don't know what the facts are, but I will bet you that they did the right thing because the information that's coming out, I... I I don't really know anything classified. I had I was on the Intelligence Committee, served there. I've I've served uh, on an advisory board on international security matters to the State Department at the request of Condoleezza Rice. Uh, I've had about I guess the highest security civilian clearance, or one of them anyway, that a civilian uh, can have. And so I, I have to remember what I know and don't know uh, from from all that. But um, Let's just say my concern is that, uh, and I'm not saying anything that's, that's, that's classified here. Uh, my concern is that uh, North Korea is subcontracting out its nuclear program to Syria. And uh, my guess is, uh, my understanding is, this, this may have been a partially completed reactor of, of some kind. And uh, we're making a deal with North Korea right now that... Uh, a lot of people are looking at very carefully. Um, everybody wants uh, a good deal, but North Korea has never lived up to an agreement in the history of its country. <clears throat> and um, verification of what they do is virtually impossible. And verification is the key to any agreement that you make with North Korea. So some people think that uh, this Syrian situation emanated from North Korea. So if that's the case, it, it, it makes it even more serious. And uh, you didn't see too much commotion or howling on the, in, on the international scene when they did what they did either. And I, my guess is that a lot of people know that they did uh, the right thing. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. America wants to know. How do you differ from Arthur Branch? The role you play as DA on Law and Order. And secondly, how can Arthur Branch and Senator Fred Thompson get together to beat Hillary Clinton? <laughs> well, you know those times when Arthur Branch is humble and lovable and kind of cuddly and friendly? That's a lot like me. Those, those times that he's mean and then surly and short-tempered, that's, that's nothing like him. So we're going to have that distinction uh, right, right there. Um, how do we beat Hillary? Um, I think I outlined it earlier in my comments. 
I didn't delineate it, that as an answer to that question. But I think we have a basic question now as a party, and that is whether or not we need to move closer to what the Democrats are doing and kind of their way of thinking, their way of doing things about certain issues in order to win because, you know, moving toward the middle, moving toward the middle, uh, the numbers don't look too good, Democrat, Republican right now, and which way the independents lead and so forth. So that's the temptation. I reject that. I think we win by adhering to strong conservative principles. I go back to 94. <clears throat> I go back to 1994. Uh, Bill Clinton had give us a pretty good thumping a little earlier. I come from a state that Bill Clinton carried twice. And... Uh, I don't like to brag. Well, I do like to brag, too, when I get a chance. But uh, I, uh, I beat, Bill, I beat uh, my opponents in a state that Bill carried twice by 20-point margins. And uh, there was a lot of consternation then in the Republican Party, where we were going nationally, where we were going in the state and that sort of thing. We took out, you know, talking about basic things, talking about the rule of law, talking about the sanctity of life, talking about free markets, free competition, using... Uh, the marketplace to solve some of these uh, uh, problems, talking about electing judges who will interpret the law and the Constitution and not make it up as they go along. <laughs> Mark mentioned my assistance uh, with Justice Roberts in the confirmation process, reminded us how important that is, as if we, if, as if we needed reminding and how quality wins out. I think a president ought to keep that in mind. I think it's one of the, the most important things that a president does. We carried that message out. I went from 20 points down to 20 points ahead on election night. Come to find out I was part of a, of a kind of a revolution. We took over the House. We took over the Senate with that uh, kind of philosophy. You know, my recollection is when Ronald Reagan started out, you know, they didn't give him uh, much of an opportunity either. The press didn't get him at all and thought that uh, he was uh, appealing to a very small part of uh, even the Republican Party. Come to find out, he had strong principles, stuck with them, believed them. He was a great communicator because he was so believable, and he was so believable because he believed so intensely, and he stuck with those beliefs. And guess what? You know, created so-called Reagan Democrats, created some independents out there who, uh, who liked what he said who knew that this would be good for America, who knew that this was the best of America that he was talking about and he was, that he was representing. And we won on that basis. I think that's the way we win next time. I don't think we need to worry as much about Hillary Clinton as we need to worry about ourselves. If we, if we react to her, If we react to her and try to finesse and, and obsess about that, I think we're playing right into their hands. I think we need to concentrate on what we ought to do. And it's not our candidate versus her. It's our candidate and the American people. And that's what it ought to come down to. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And find out more about all the presidential candidates by visiting campaignnetwork.org. A programming reminder, President Bush's Attorney General nominee, Michael Mukasey, goes before the Senate Judiciary Committee later this morning. If confirmed, he'd replace Alberto Gonzalez. We'll have live coverage on C-SPAN 3, C-SPAN Radio, and on C-SPAN.org at 10 a.m. Eastern.